In the Second World War, hundreds of thousands of men fight for a genocidal foreign power that considers them subhuman. By the end of the conflict, half of Himmler's Waffen-SS will be non-Germanic foreigners. To save the Aryan race, Himmler is willing to spill a lot of non-Aryan blood. This is part two of our series on the Waffen-SS and its foreign fighters. This is a special episode of War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. In the first part of this series, we saw how Himmler imagined his SS as a tool to build the foundations of a greater German Reich by recruiting Volksdeutsche and people he considered to be of Germanic blood. This recruitment was based on illogical but still fairly strict racial criteria. By now, in early 1944, Himmler's army counts Balts, Bosniaks, and Ukrainians. How has this change come about? Like all branches of the German military, the Waffen-SS has an insatiable demand for manpower. As the Soviets advance westwards, Himmler's men are deployed as a sort of firefighting force for sealing breaches at the front and driving counterattacks. And away from the front line, Himmler needs more men for his brutal anti-partisan war, or Bandenbekämpfung, as resistance flares up across Europe. For years now, some SS officials have suggested following the example of the German army, the Heer, less bound by racial dogma, the army established volunteer units for Soviet citizens at the end of 1941. By war's end, at least one million Russians, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Georgians, Chechens, what have you, will serve in Wehrmacht combat and non-combat roles. But Himmler has repeatedly refused to follow such a policy. He is happy employing Slavs in auxiliary police forces, but bringing them into his prized Waffen-SS would be a step too far. But perhaps Himmler can expand his fighting force without diluting its racial quality. Himmler relies on a recent development in Nazi pseudoscience. Back in October 1941, an SS officer named Wolfgang Abel was let loose to examine some 42,000 Soviet POW. He took photographs and measurements of heads and bodies and took blood samples. In early 1942, Abel came to a shocking discovery after analyzing his data. Now, you might think that shocking discovery is that his pseudoscience, phrenology, is pure poppycock or balderdash of the highest order, if you like. But no, no such luck. Instead, he concluded that these Slavic Untermenschen had some Aryan features, he assumed from interbreeding with past Germanic conquerors. For now, this isn't enough to change Himmler's opinion on Slavs. Instead, he turns to the Baltics first. He tells the SS Bain office that the Estonians are an ethnic group with whom, after having excluded a very few elements, we could mix. After an agreement with Estonian nationalists, the Estonian Legion is formally established in October 1942. When Himmler inspects the men in January 1943, he claims racially they could not be distinguished from Germans. The Germans introduce conscription in March 1943, and the Legion grows in size to become a brigade. Part of this brigade fights at the Battle of Kursk in the summer of 1943 with the 5th SS Panzer Division Viking. Later this month, it's expanded into a full division with the designation 20th Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS, 1st Estonian. The story is similar in neighboring Latvia, where men are already serving in the auxiliary police. Along with new conscripts, they become the 15th Waffengrenadier Division of the SS, 1st Latvian, in March 1943. A second Latvian division is formed this month. At their peak strength in June 1944, the Latvian divisions will count over 87,000 men. Now, you may notice that I haven't mentioned the third Baltic state. Lithuania. That's because of a very complex situation that makes them less visible in the Waffen-SS system. Despite that they have one of the largest number of SS auxiliary police volunteers per capita of all the Soviet states, who top the kill tally of Jews per volunteer. 
Paradoxically, and for reasons too complicated to go through here, the Lithuanian administration manages to resist the recruitment and conscription efforts by Himmler and the Wehrmacht in 1943. Nonetheless, up to 10,000 of the Lithuanian SS police volunteers will enter service in other Waffen SS organized units, but they will not form a national union. We'll get back to what happens instead in our regular War Against Humanity episodes. In any case, it's important to note that Himmler doesn't consider these new recruits to be on the same racial level as the Reich Germans or the Germanic foreigners. The SS recruitment office splits the Waffen SS into three tiers. At the top are what they call classic SS divisions like 1st SS Panzer Division Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler, which recruit only Reich Germans. Next come the volunteer division, like the 7th SS Volunteer Mountain Division Prinz Eugen I mentioned earlier. These recruit Volksdeutsche and Germanic foreigners. In Himmler's view, the classic divisions and volunteer divisions are an integral part of the SS, but he does not consider the Latvian, Estonian, or other non-Germanics worthy of SS membership. He calls them alien ethnic groups, which we are now organizing under the command of the SS. Instead of SS divisions, they are referred to as Waffen divisions. Himmler sees these Waffen divisions sort of like a foreign legion or auxiliary force. Apart from ethnic German officers and NCOs, the men are not allowed to wear the SS SIG runes on their uniform. Instead, they wear divisional emblems. Like everything to do with Nazi administration, this system is far from consistent. Some divisions start as volunteer divisions before becoming Waffen divisions, but one constant is that the men swear loyalty to Hitler, and most of them also have the SS blood group underarm tattoo. The oath, in particular, is a source of friction. To appease nationalistic sentiment, the oaths are also mentioning the fight against Bolshevism and include some nationalistic platitudes. But what motivates the men who fight in these new Waffen divisions? In many divisions, conscripts make up the majority of recruits, but plenty of the fighters are volunteers, especially those who already served in the auxiliary police. The reasons for volunteering are complex. Latvian auxiliaries have already committed massacres of Jews and communists, and many volunteers buy into the Nazi myth of Judeo-Bolshevism. But this doesn't equal a wholehearted embrace of German rule. Most of the volunteers are nationalists. They see their service in the Waffen-SS as a continuation of their service to Latvia and a chance to perhaps secure some degree of Latvian autonomy. A Latvian colonel named Willis Janums will tell a German colleague, We are not Germans and we are not men of the SS. For years and with pride we had worn the Latvian uniform. As soon as this war is over, we will take off our current uniforms. Above all, the Reich is the lesser of two evils and a defense against a repeat of the brutal Soviet occupation of 1940 and 41. As one Latvian soldier will later say, most of us believe that the Germans really wanted to help us get rid of the Russian barbarians. On the other side of Europe, something even more interesting is happening. By summer 1942, the Yugoslav partisans are giving Himmler a real headache. First, he tries to solve the problem with a unit made up of Reich Germans and Volksdeutsche. The 7th SS Volunteer Mountain Division, Prince Eugen, is sent to the region in October. But they make little progress in crushing the resistance. Some community leaders of Yugoslavia's Bosnian Muslims, or Bosniaks, have offered to form a division of their own. They believe it will win them greater autonomy from Ante Pavlic's independent state of Croatia and bring them closer to the Reich. Himmler takes them up on this, but the Bosniaks are Slavs, so why does he like this idea? Well, together with the Bosniak leaders, Himmler cooks up a fiction that Bosnian Muslims are not actually Slavic, but of Persian descent. This means that Aryan blood flows through their veins. Himmler takes the idea to Hitler and the Führer gives his approval in February 1943. Someone else who approves of the Bosniak divisions is the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Amin al-Husseini. We've 
gotten a bio special on him, exploring how his anti-British and anti-Semitic worldview lead to his attachment to Nazi Germany. The Mufti helps with recruitment, and the division has 20,000 men by July. The majority are Bosniaks, but 20% are Catholic Croatians. Himmler adopts a neo-Ottoman aesthetic for his new unit. The division's badge is the Hanschar, a traditional curved sword. This is also worn on their uniforms instead of the SS runes. A field grey phase finishes the ensemble with a red one for dress uniforms. As the Bosniaks join up in Yugoslavia, more Slavs are joining a division in Eastern Europe. That would be the 14th SS division, Galicia. This is one of the divisions that starts out as a volunteer division, but by the summer of 1944 will be redesignated a Waffen division. This division is the brainchild of Dr. Otto Gustav von Wechta, the regional governor of Galicia in occupied Poland. He has good relationships with Ukrainian nationalists, and by spring 1943, he finally convinces Himmler to bring Ukrainians into the Waffen SS. He argues that binding them to the Reich will be essential to hold back the Soviets. Once again, Himmler goes to great lengths to pretend he isn't recruiting Slavs. Galicia was part of the Austrian Empire, so he declares that his new soldiers are of Germanic descent. The terms Ukraine and Ukrainian must not be used. The Germans have banned the Ukrainian national symbol, the trident. Instead, the division wears the regional symbol, the Galician lion. But from the start, the division takes on a Ukrainian character. Vechta enlists the help of the head of the Ukrainian Central Committee, Volodymyr Kubiovich. He hopes the division will form the core of some sort of autonomous Ukrainian army. He convinces the Germans to allow Catholic and Orthodox chaplains into the divisions and to appoint Ukrainian officers to divisional command posts. The men will receive similar benefits to German soldiers in the Wehrmacht and the Waffen SS. The Germans also release some Ukrainian political prisoners. Recruitment begins in May in towns and cities across Galicia. But as one division takes shape, cracks start to appear in another. As we saw in our bio on Amin al-Husseini, both Himmler and Hitler have a perverse respect for Islam. Their theological understanding is hardly profound, but they admire the anti-Semitism of the Grand Mufti and the Muslim soldiers he helps to recruit. They also believe Muslims are more willing to die in battle than Christians. In August 1943, Himmler sets out instructions on respecting the Bosniaks in accordance with their religious law. They should never be served pork or sausage containing pork and should never be given alcohol to drink. I also forbid any joking about these matters. But some of the German and Volksdeutsche officers ignore this. Even worse for the SS, partisans have infiltrated the division and convinced some of the men to join their cause. Things come to a head in September 1943, while the division is training in the French commune of Villefranche de Rouergue. A small group of Muslims and Catholic soldiers mutiny, take German personnel hostage, and kill five German officers. The uprising is put down quickly with the assistance of one of the division's imams. After arrests, executions, and a purge of unreliable elements, the unit moves to Silesia for further training. There, the Reichsführer makes a mockery of any Bosniak autonomy by having the men swear their oath not just to Hitler, but to Ante Pavelic. In October, they are finally named 13th Waffen Mountain Division of the SS, 1st Croatian. They will continue training until February this year and will finally be deployed on anti-partisan duties in Yugoslavia in March. By the time the Hanshar Division is sworn in, initial recruitment is almost finished for the Galician Division. By November 1943, 80,000 men have registered. Many are volunteers, but the Germans have ordered that anyone with previous military experience as an officer or NCO must enlist. 80,000 is a huge number, enough for three or even four divisions, but the SS continue to enforce rigorous criteria. They have reduced the infamous minimum height requirement from 170 to 165 centimeters, but still only about 13,000 men pass their medicals and enter training. Many of the German and Volksdeutsche officers treat the Ukrainians poorly when they arrive at the harsh SS Truppenübungsplatz Heidelaga in the south of occupied Poland. One recruit will recall how his platoon commander was always ill-tempered, excelled in yelling, abusing, and insulting, and was always trying hard to persecute and abuse us. 
Even the more sympathetic German officers hold patronizing views based on Nazi racial theory. One will later write, among Ukrainians emotions overshadow reason, emotions that well up from the depth of the soul constitute the leitmotif of the Ukrainian life. This characteristic seems to apply to all Slavs. The Ukrainians really have little love for National Socialism or German rule. Far more Ukrainians, about 4.5 million, are fighting in the Red Army against Nazism. Those who have volunteered for the Waffen-SS are nationalists above all else. They see alignment with the Germans as the only way to hold back the forces responsible for the 1930s Holodomor famine and as the best bet for some form of Ukrainian sovereignty. They never accept their designation as Galicians and infuriate their German officers by painting their barracks with the Ukrainian trident. By the time the Galician division sees battle in July, the situation for the Germans will be even more desperate than now. As the Allies advance in the East and Italy and soon in France, Himmler's personal power becomes ever greater. He moves closer to Hitler's side, becoming his prince of destruction. The Waffen-SS grows even larger. Across the remains of the Nazi Empire, there are more volunteers and even more forcibly conscripted. More men are thrown into battle to hold back the inevitable. More men will die to serve the Reichsführer and his delusions of a Germanic Empire. For more on Amin al-Husseini and the Nazi relationship with Islam, click here for our bio-special on him. Now, our legions, the Time Ghost Army, armed with the power of history and remembrance, are fighting everything the SS stood for. We fight for tolerance, peace, stability, and human rights by showing how we can learn from our past mistakes and successes. Join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Never forget.